What Jesus says today makes me think of what I've been reading in Thomas Merton. Merton was one of the sources of guidance to which I turned during my sabbatical last year, and the way that he reads and interprets scriptures has helped me think about things on a whole new level. For example, today, when Jesus says that whoever wishes to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses it for his sake will save it, I can't help but notice that the Greek word here is the word psuche, which is the source of our word psyche. Unlike in English, psuche doesn't just refer to the mental or psychological part of a person, but rather uh, that sort of thing that makes a person who they are. It refers to that something that animates us, that makes us more than just lumps of meat and bone. It's what makes me specifically me. In some contexts, that word gets translated soul or self. And that's why I think of Merton, because he writes quite a bit about our concept of self. Our self, who we think of ourselves as being, it's a, it's a constructed reality. Merton realizes this. It's made up of all the things that we know about ourselves and there's perspectives through which we see the world. It's made up of things like our personality, our likes and dislikes, our gender identity and expression, our sexual orientation, our personal philosophy, political orientation, our nationality, our race, things like that. But what Merton points out is that all of those are things about me. They're not me. The true me, who I actually am, is somewhere beneath all of that. We often conflate the two, confusing this constructed person for our true self, but Merton reminds us that that's an illusion. The man that I have constructed from all these bits of information and personality and character traits, that's not the man that God knows, because God didn't create him. I did. The true person, the one that God created, is somewhere beneath all of that. That is what Merton calls the true self. I found great wisdom in this, as sort of esoteric as that is, because it helps me, helps me make sense of the world in a new way. But what I want to tell you about today is my reading partner. See, I brought my copy of The New Seeds of Contemplation. It's a pre-owned book, and the previous owner inscribed their name in the cover, R. Ferguson. As I've been reading New Seeds, R. Ferguson has been my constant companion. They've recorded several epiphanies and questions in the margins, and I've come to know them a little bit from what they found important to underline. I feel like I know this person. From the handwriting, I can guess that R. Ferguson is a, a, a woman, probably younger. I've started calling her Rachel. Some of the things that Rachel writes and the words that she uses make me think that she's come from a non-denominational or a fundamentalist background. And I've appreciated seeing her get excited when she hears Merton talking about getting to know God more fully and from the questions that she asks. Now, she starts in the book with a lot of underlines and exclamation points and stars and circles But as things draw on, I see her begin to push back against him. She leaves more question marks and fewer stars. She records more questions that have a sense of grief in them. At one point, Merton writes about finding holiness, experiencing holiness, and she writes, no, big exclamation, capital letters, big exclamation point, no! We can never become or experience God's holiness this side of heaven. Christ's holiness or righteousness is declared unto us, right? The last note in that chapter, very confusing, sanctity versus holiness. I get that. It is a little confusing. But what intrigues me most about Rachel today is the note that she leaves in chapter 9. Merton writes, Therefore, when you and I become what we are really meant to be, we will discover not only that we love one another perfectly, but that we are both living in Christ and Christ in us. 
and we are all one in Christ. We will see that it is He who loves in us. In other words, when we let go of our false selves and consent to being who God is creating us to be, consent to that image of God in which we were created, we find that our true self at the core of each of us is Christ. As St. Paul puts it, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Merton recognizes that if it's Christ that lives in me and in you and you and you and you, then we are all of us one person. It's at this point that Rachel writes in the margin, so do we lose some sense of person or individuality in heaven? Now, maybe I'm projecting here, but when I read that question, I hear loss and disappointment. It's the same loss and disappointment I hear from Peter today in St. Mark's story. Jesus seems to know that his personal life, his psuche, is unimportant because he lives in all people and all people live in him. I wonder if that's why he seems to shun that title, that Messiah, that Peter, Peter gives him, and instead prefers Son of Man, which really just means the human one, the person. Jesus may be able to let go of his self, his psuche, but Peter is not. Peter loves Jesus and doesn't want to lose him. We can all identify with that. And so when Jesus starts talking about suffering and dying, Peter tries to talk him out of it. It may also be that Peter has a little bit more at stake than just his friend's life. He may be concerned about how this is going to sound to all the people who expect the Messiah to ride in on a white horse and deliver them from the Romans and to make Judea great again. Maybe that's part of why he tries to shut down Jesus' talk about suffering and dying. But Jesus, of course, knows that those expectations are not his. They belong to all the other people who have thoughts and feelings about what Messiah is and what Messiah does. Those expectations and desires and earnest hopes are part of a self, a psuche that does not belong to him, a self that God did not create and does not know. If people, if we, are ever to understand what he has come to tell us, we need to be able to let go of that false self so that we can see the truth of who God really is. When Jesus asks that question, what can a person give in return for their life, I hear two different questions. The first is a question of priority. What are we willing to give to save our life? What are we willing to give up to save or preserve our sense of self? When the rubber meets the road, what are we willing to part with? But also, to what lengths will we go to save ourselves? What are we willing to take from one another? What are we willing to do to each other? If it's a question of saving myself, Am I willing to oppress or do violence? Am I willing to, to uh, kill to save my life? Is that to what God is calling me? That false self, our sense of who we are that's defined by all those things unique to us, maybe that needs to die in order for that true self to be saved. History has shown that Human beings are willing to commit all kinds of terrible atrocities to protect themselves from those we deem threats. But what is the cost of our salvation? Or as Jesus puts it, what does it profit a person to gain the whole world and forfeit their soul? If our souls, our true selves, are to be saved from being lost down this path of defensiveness and mistrust and hatred, we have to be willing to let go of that false self. 
It must be allowed to die. And this is where the second question becomes interesting. Jesus asks, what can a person give in return for their self? And I hear it also as a rhetorical question. What could a person possibly give in return for their life? Nothing, of course. Nothing can buy off death, right? But ironically, there is nothing to give because the gift has already been given. There is nothing we can give for our life or ourself because those things are gifts from God, unasked for and unearned, right? That we should feel the need to grasp and hoard what God gives so freely is kind of ridiculous. It's like the Israelites hoarding manna in the wilderness. It's utter nonsense and ultimately futile. I wonder if this is what Jesus hopes that he can help us to see. That the gifts of God have already been given us, even if we can't see them. Peter, Peter, who has faithfully followed and truly seen who Jesus is, even Peter can't see the true gift right in front of him. According to Jesus, the true gift may actually be the cross. It's the ability to follow Jesus in letting go of ourselves that so enslave us and our, to our own pre- self-preservation and to be free, truly free to live life that is not constantly overshadowed by the need to protect it or exert power over others to preserve it. When Peter rightly states who Jesus is, Jesus immediately starts talking about what that means. What does it mean to be the Messiah? That to be the Messiah means to suffer and be rejected and to die and to rise again. Peter wants a Messiah who will save the souls, the lives of all God's people, even at the expense of the lives of the Romans or the Greeks or the Parthians or whoever else might try to conquer them. He rebukes Jesus because he's not ready for this truth. Rachel wasn't ready for the truth either, it seems. She never made it to the next chapter. That plaintive question is one of the last things that she wrote in Merton's book before she set it down, never to take it up again, to sell it so that I could buy it. No more underlinings, no more stars, no more questions or rebukes. She couldn't follow any further. I wonder, is our sense of self so important to us that we would let it keep us from following Jesus in the way of the cross? Are we so attached to our own experience of who we think we are that we would turn away from the Messiah? Or are we able to let go of the masks that we've constructed for ourselves and to follow Jesus into a fuller experience of knowing God? I wonder if Jesus chose not to be known as God's Messiah, the one expected to come on a white horse, but rather as the Son of Man, the human one, so that all the other sons and daughters of humanity might be able to look and see for ourselves that our individual lives, our psukes, are nothing but a tiny part of the giant life that God has given us to share. I wonder if he's willing to let go of his own life, not because we needed some blood debt to be paid, but so that we could see for ourselves that the loss of a self, of a psuche, is not the same thing as the loss of the eternal life that God has already granted to us. The life that already shines somewhere deep within each and every one of us. if we really do share this one life with all of creation, not just the other sons and daughters of humanity, but if all people and all creatures really are one person, one Christ, alive in God, what does that look like? How does that change us? How does that free us? What are we free now to let go of? 
What are we free to take up? Maybe we would see that there is nothing for us to save, nothing for us to preserve, nothing to subdue or submit to, nothing to exploit, except our own self, God's own self, staring at us from the face of every living thing that God has created.